Our focus today is on risk and needs assessment. I'm really pleased that on behalf of our statistical analysis center that we are uh, convening this bridging research to practice series on risk and needs assessments. I'm Anon Butler, the executive director of CJCC. And I'm going to ask our SAC members to introduce themselves first because they're really the, the brain trust behind this. So, Ellen, you want to start us off? I'm Ellen McCann. I'm a statistician with Statistical Analysis Center, the DC CJCC. I'm the one that sent you that email. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Dorian gets you to come out to this. And also, the one who's really behind the planning for today's session. So, thank you for pulling this together. All right. And other, our other SAC members? Uh, David Merriman, Policy and Research Analyst. Okay. And we have two other. Uh, Sandra Yellows, Cudero, Research Analyst. All right. And we have one of the SAC members, Charlia Robertson, who is probably make this some magic happen downstairs. So with that, I want to actually turn it over to you because I think it's going to be helpful for us to know who's in the room before we get into the meat of today's session. So Ms. Mason. <coughs> Dolores Mason, Department of Behavioral Health. Yes, Three and Julie Sorry. Yes, sweet. It's uh, DOJ BOP Research. Okay, welcome. Yvonne DuBose, investigator. <coughs> Son at UNSC of SA. Uh, Jason Gordon, uh, saying. Okay, you'll be here, I see. Yeah. Okay. Tremaine Newsom, MPD. And I'm going to turn it MPD. Shana Woods, MPD. Okay. Rashida George, DYRS. Hey. Welcome. Demond Tiggs, Pre-Trial Services, Special Assistant. Great. Uh, Avi Bhatti, Max Salt, on behalf of BSA. Amanda Pederiti from DYRS. Megan McNeil from DYRS. Mike Williams from Pre-Trial Services. appreciate it. So good morning, everyone. Um, it's really great to see such a large crowd here this morning. Um, I've had an opportunity to do one of these brown bags previously. It was actually a couple of years ago, and we were in a very small room with about 10 people. It was an excellent session, but to see the large group here and being in this large conference room for this important topic um, is, is inspiring for me, and I appreciate all of you being here today. Um, I'm going to lead off this session and try and facilitate things a little bit as well. But I'm going to lead off by talking a little bit about a couple of issues that have to do with risk assessment. Uh, I'm going to try and give a little bit of a historical or evolutionary perspective about what risk assessment is and how it's being used in the criminal justice system. Uh, I want to talk for a few minutes at least about some of the issues or challenges or problems that the field has identified when risk assessment is used within the criminal justice system. And then the last thing that I'm going to touch on has to do with some work that I've been doing, actually it's concluded now, but work I've done over the past five years for the SMART office at the U.S. Department of Justice. And I'm going to stumble over the uh, acronym, but I believe 
when I try to, if I can get it right, uh, the SMART office is the Office of Sex Offender Sentencing, Monitoring, Apprehension, Registration, and Tracking, if I think, I, I think I've got that actually right. Uh, not sure, I might have missed something in there or that, but um, in that work, um, I and some colleagues had been doing some work to actually look at the scientific literature on sexual offending and sex offender management. And one of the things that we looked at was the use of risk assessment for both adult sexual offenders and juveniles who have committed sexual crimes. And I'm going to end my sort of beginning presentation here with a little bit of sort of insight of some of the findings that come out of the science for both risk assessment for adults and then juveniles who commit sexual offenses. Um, then I'll turn it over to some of our other speakers. I know we have some excellent presentations and some very um, sort of robust material that will get more down into the weeds about risk assessment than I will in my material. But I think what, um, hopefully that what I'm going to talk about here will be a good sort of opening foundation set the stage for what everybody else is going to be talking about. Um, so I wanted to start out, as I said, with a little bit of a brief history, if you will, about risk assessment. And without going into a great level of detail, one of the things that I just wanted to try and point out in talking about the history or the evolution of risk assessment tools is that risk assessment originally started out in a way that's being kind of described or talked about as being unstructured, <coughs> professional, clinical judgment where a clinician or a practitioner who is actually trying to assess and understand and make a prediction about an individual offender's propensity to either reoffend or engage in some other negative behavior, depending on what your standpoint is, that they would use their best judgment, their gut feeling, their experience, or so forth, to be able to predict whether or not this person was likely to commit a future offense in a pretrial setting, um, abscond from returning to court, things of this nature. Unstructured clinical judgment or unstructured risk assessment has been assessed very, very robustly in the scientific literature and in research, and it's found not to be a very accurate way to predict future behavior, things of that nature. Well, we start to look at also the other ways the risk assessment is being done, and one of the things I want to mention here is that there's also something that's called structured risk assessment. And while I have this as sort of the next line or bullet in this history of risk assessment tools and instruments, structured risk assessment in some ways is also being used today. It's not actually something that I think would fall into a linear historical path like what I have here on the bullets. But structured risk assessment in this context, and what I'm getting at, is where actual predictors of risk that have been identified through research and through science are used by a clinical professional, and they are actually mandated to be used as something that that clinical professional is going to take into account. When they're looking at an individual and offender to predict whether or not that individual will recidivate in the future, return to court, things of that nature. In many ways, structured risk assessment has the same kind of uh, um, characteristics, if you will, as unstructured, but the difference here is that there are research-based identified predictors of risk that that individual assessor or evaluator must take into account when they're assessing the risk of the individual. Uh, both of these, the unstructured and the structured risk assessment that they're being characterized, are very, very different than what are called actuarial tools. In actuarial risk assessment, what basically takes place is that through research, through science, predictors of future events such as violence, criminal recidivism, um, absconding, failure to return to court, things of those natures, um, those are identified through research. They are weighted and put together in a scheme in which an individual practitioner will use those types of characteristics to look at the individual and make a prediction about future behavior. The thing with actuarial risk assessment tools is that they are tested or should be tested on the population that it's being used on locally through what's called a validation procedure. The entire sort of use of actuarial risk assessment instruments, if you will, is driven by and based upon research findings. And the expert sort of judgment that comes out of some clinician, 
simply based on their experience or their gut feeling or things of that nature, tends to be removed from the process. The research on actuarial risk assessment tools demonstrates that they are far better predictors of what an individual offender is going to be involved in in the future than either unstructured or structured risk assessment tools. So an actuarial validated standardized tool is really the preferred method today in doing risk assessment in the criminal justice system. This doesn't mean in any way that actuarial risk assessment instruments are always precise in terms of what they predict. There are going to be false negatives and false positives. There are going to be errors that are there. But relative to all the other ways that we know about, in terms of being able to predict the likelihood that someone will recidivate, or that someone can commit an act of violence, or someone will or will not return to court, the evidence clearly demonstrate that actuarial risk assessment tools are far superior to any other approach. Now, one of the things that's happened in recent years is that when you look at actuarial tools, they are primarily based upon what are called static factors that are related to recidivism or whatever the outcome of interest is for that organization or that agency. And static factors cannot be changed. They are things like prior criminal history, age at first arrest, and I could go on down the, the line of sort of um, items that have been found through science to be predictors of future behavior in that way. What the original actuarial risk assessment instruments did not take into account were what are called dynamic factors. Factors that are also known as criminogenic needs and they're factors that differ from static factors because they can be changed through programming, services, some intervention. So things like criminal thinking, criminal associates, other things like substance abuse, mental health issues, and on down the line, it can go through many of these. These are all issues that have been found through science and through research to contribute in some cases to criminality and so they are important to take a look at, but what is also key about them is that they provide an indicator or a target for interventions and for treatment. And so tools that are coming out now in the latest generation of risk assessment look at both static factors that will predict risk, but also those dynamic factors that are related to risk of recidivism, and they combine them into the latest generation of tools. Uh, there are some issues that I'll get to about these types of uh, the, the uh, third generation tools here, but the basic point that I want to make in terms of the evolution and the history about risk assessment is that the science is absolutely clear that actuarial approaches are far better, are far more precise, are far more sort of efficient and effective to use than our clinical judgment, whether we're talking about unstructured or structured risk assessment. That's the key take-home point I want to make about sort of the history here. Now, if I can get this to work. Switch it. Switch it. Switch it. Switch it. That would be helpful. There you go. See that one. There you go. Good. Turn it off. Okay. So to point out some of the key issues or problems that have been identified through research, through science, with the unstructured, the, when we're talking about approaches that are non-actuarial in, in, in nature, is first of all that, sorry to say, but clinicians and practitioners that are relying simply on their gut feeling or their experience or what they perceive when they're interviewing that offender, that there tend to be, tends to be overconfidence and their ability to predict a future event or failure to return to court or things of that nature. The science also shows that when two different evaluators or assessors assess the same individual, that there tends to be what's called non-inter-rater um, non reliability. In other words, those two different people that are assessing the same offender come away with a different assessment and different results in terms of their perceived risk. 
And that is a huge problem when we talk about using those unstructured types of approaches. When you look at actuarial tools and their use, one of the key tests about their validity and their ability to be actually successful and, and efficient and effective is something that's called inter-rater reliability, where there are checks that are made about how those tools are used by different people and ensuring when different people, different evaluators, different assessors are assessing the same offender that they arrive at the same results through that tool. So inter-rater reliability is a key aspect of being able to check how well a tool is sort of being used and also how valid it is and it shows again that those actuarial instruments are the best approaches to be able to put into place. There also tends to be bias when the individual practitioner is not relying on an actuarial tool, both in terms of trying to look for those risk factors that that individual already perceives belongs to or is sort of in, inside of that offender, what that individual assessor or evaluator's perceived risk is going to be ahead of time tends to be looked for when that individual is interviewing and assessing the offender. There also tends to be, through the research has found, both conscious and unconscious bias that might be around things like ethnicity, gender, social economic status, and so forth. All of these are problems and challenges that result when you're using something other than an actuarial tool. That's exactly why the science tells us we, not, we need to stay away from moving in those types of directions. Uh, risk assessment is used across the criminal justice system, basically from law enforcement all the way through the back end of corrections and reentry. Most of the work with risk assessment was originally associated with originated in the area of corrections and it has slowly sort of migrated or propagated to other areas of the system where today we see now risk assessment instruments being used for example in pretrial detention. Now I know here in DC you've been a leader in pretrial services and pretrial aspects of the criminal justice system for many many years. You've used risk assessment here for a long time. There are many many jurisdictions across the country where that has not been the case. And they are only now first taking a look at trying to develop or use risk assessment to help to inform decisions about release from jail, bail, and so forth. Uh, Pretrial is an important place for risk assessment to be done. We know today how much reform is being talked about in the pretrial and the bail setting because of what we learned through research about how pretrial populations in our jails tend to be indigent individuals who simply can't make it out of jail because they don't have the money to pay bail. And the release decisions aren't made at all on public safety issues or return to court issues. It happens to simply be based on money and the financial status. What risk assessment in that pretrial setting can do, obviously, is help to remove that aspect from the decision making from the bail decision and actually ensure that release decisions are really embedded in public safety and based on risk rather than financial status. Risk assessment is also being talked about and used in certain jurisdictions today to make sentencing decisions and that's controversial in many ways and talked about as being something that some jurisdictions are very interested in and others are backing away from. But having a risk assessment tool available to whether it's pretrial or probation or whoever's putting together a pre-sentence investigation so that a judge has the ability to look at an individual's risk levels and criminogenic needs before a sentence is actually put into place is something that people are talking about more and more today and that you're starting to find in more and more jurisdictions. Again, it's not something that's out there on a widespread basis, but it can very much help a judge decide not only what an appropriate sentence can be, but also what a, an appropriate set of conditions can be if someone is going to be released into the community instead of placed behind bars. Again, not used on a widespread basis, but we're starting to see it more and more. Of course, in probation, it's been used for a long time on a widespread basis to be able, again, to determine the conditions or levels of supervision and the conditions of supervision. 
Probably on a widespread basis, when we talk about the prevalence of risk assessment, there's no place that it's used more than in a probation or community <coughs> correction setting. Makes sense, that's where it all sort of started. It's also obviously used in the institutional setting, in prisons and also in jails, to determine custody status, where individuals are going to be housed. Now, in a lot of institutions, an individual offense can dictate where indeed you are going to be housed. But once you start to move away from the most serious or heinous offenses, like murder or extreme acts of violence, then we start to look at, and, and it makes more sense to be able to make custodial decisions based upon risk level that is assessed through a validated actuarial risk, risk assessment instruments. We also start to see now the use of risk assessment instruments by paroling authorities and release authorities. And this is relatively new as well. And we're seeing it on a more widespread basis today than if you look back five years ago or so, but it's the notion of being able to look at the risk level of an individual when a parole decision is made about release from institutional custody. It's also used in that sense when we talk about looking at criminogenic needs as risk and need assessment as a combined tool to be able to determine if that, not only if that individual should be released on parole, but what the level of supervision in the community should be and what the conditions of supervision should be. This is also a very, very important tool in the reentry context to be able to determine what should be in a transition plan or a case management plan once that individual is going to be released from custody. So my point here is that we've seen risk assessment instruments start out primarily in corrections, <coughs> but propagate and move to all areas of criminal justice. In fact, even in law enforcement today, there are some jurisdictions that use risk assessment tools to help them make, for example, arrest decisions in domestic violence cases, things of that nature. So we've seen it really begin in corrections and move across the entire system, and I would only expect it to continue to be used on a more widespread, prevalent basis across all areas of criminal justice. Now the next two slides here just are sort of an, uh, um, um, a listing of what some of the risk factors and criminogenic needs are that have been identified through research. I won't go through these in much detail, but if you look at things like what we find in here, um, I mentioned things like substance abuse or mental health issues, criminal thinking, criminal attitudes, criminal associates. One of the things that we know from research about desistance from crime and what facilitates desistance from crime is number one, stable employment is extremely, extremely important. And also family or marital or marriage, sort of relationships that are strong and stable in terms of family members. We can't really do anything in our system to encourage or to move someone into a marriage relationship. But there's a lot that we can do to build social capital and build and strengthen relationships between an individual, for example, that's coming off probation or coming out of an institution so that they have strong ties to family members and to pro-social models and so forth that are out there in the community. Because what we know from that research as well is that informal social controls have far more impact on an individual's behavior than the formal social controls that are placed on individuals by the criminal justice system through parole officers, probation officers, things of that nature. And I can't stress how important the nature of stable, meaningful employment is. Uh, several years ago, there was a piece of work that was done by the National Academies of Sciences, the National Research Council, that looked at supervision's effect on it, desistance from crime and other factors that actually have an impact on desistance from crime. And what that expert panel of researchers and looking at all the science found is that the two most important factors to facilitate desistance were stable, meaningful employment and that marriage or strong relationship with some type of family member. Those were absolutely critical. Of course, becoming older relates to desistance as crime because as people age, they are less likely to engage in a criminal lifestyle. Getting off drugs, having mental health issues addressed are important, but this notion of having stable work, stable housing, 
and having relationships in the community was found to be so critically important. A risk assessment and its value is all predicated on work that we know from science about the importance of what are called the risk, need, and responsivity principles. We know more today about how to reduce recidivism and create the types of results we're looking for with our populations that we're working with far more than we knew 20, 30 years ago, even 10 years ago. And one of the key findings is that there are key principles, if you will, that are called the eight principles of correctional, effective correctional intervention. Everyone working in corrections should know what they are. I would argue everyone working in criminal justice should know what they are. But you can take the eight of them and boil them down to three very, very important ones that everyone should be familiar with, and that's the risk principle, the need principle, and the responsivity principle. And the risk principle is all about the notion that we need to focus our resources, our attention, both in terms of supervision and services, on the highest risk offenders. And I would argue, when we find individuals who are low risk and low need in terms of criminogenic needs, I can get in trouble when I say this, but we're better off almost leaving those individuals alone than we are in doing anything with them at all. The notion here is to be able to focus what we're doing on the individuals that have the highest risk and need levels. And that's not only a matter of efficiency in terms of the expedient and the, the, the um, most cost beneficial use of taxpayer dollars, it also has to do with the fact that when we deal with low risk offenders in a way that provides them high levels of supervision and intensive levels of services, we can actually not only be inefficient with the expenditure of our dollars, we can do more harm than good. In other words, we can increase the likelihood that those individuals will engage in criminal behavior, recidivate, and not desist from crime. So the risk principle is absolutely key to everything that we do. The need principle is all about focusing our intervention efforts on targets that are the criminogenic needs that are identified in that individual. Being able to identify, as I say, those dynamic factors that exist and can be changed through programming, through intervention, and so forth, and ensuring that that's where we're targeting our services. And the responsivity pr principle has actually been researched far less than risk and need, but it's a notion that treatment and services and whatever we're doing in terms of being able to intervene actually is aligned well with things like the learning styles, the culture, the other characteristics of that individual that will help that person to engage in whatever treatment or intervention or service we're providing. There's a very large body of research out there that shows that programming, intervention, and services, whatever the terminology is going to be, that those services are much more likely to be effective if the individual is engaged in them, if they actually can benefit from them. And that may seem like an abstract sort of concept in a way to think about, but it's critically, critically important. We need to make sure that what we're doing is a good match for the needs of that individual, for their learning style, for their cognitive capability, for their ethnicity, for their gender, for all of these different factors that can come into play. Now, there's a, um, in the, the, I want to mention something about the sex offender research that I've been doing, because I think it's a good example about what responsivity is all about. In the treatment of sexual offenders, uh, there is some debate that still goes on within the <coughs> practitioner and policymaker communities about whether or not treatment for sexual offenders actually works, whether it can be effective. And the advocates who make an argument that treatment is ineffective, that it does not work, point to a particular study, tend to point to a particular study, which is one of the lone randomized controlled trials that's ever been done on treatment effectiveness for sexual offenders was done in the state of California, the study was published in 2005. It looked at a group of sex offenders who received treatment in a prison, and there were two control groups that were involved in this as well. 
The final results of that study, a randomized controlled trial, found that the people that received treatment did not have lower recidivism rates at all than the individuals who did not receive treatment. And people point to that study and say, look, this is the evidence that treatment doesn't work because we don't have RCTs, these sophisticated studies that tell us the opposite that we can point to and say, yeah, treatment does indeed work. But one of the things that that study found, and one of the things that the authors of that research, the people that did the work, will also acknowledge, is that that treatment program in Atascadero, California, did not adhere to the principles of risk, need, and responsivity, but also that the people, the offenders, who were in the treatment program and were responsive to it, who actually engaged in the treatment and actually thought that it was actually going to be something that they wanted to actually embrace and move forward with, that lo and behold, those individuals had far lower recidivism rates than anybody in the control groups that were done, that were used in that study. And the point that I'm trying to make here is that this application of risk and need and responsivity is critically, critically important in everything that we're doing in terms of intervention. And you cannot do these things. You cannot adhere to the principles of risk and need without solid risk assessment. It is all predicated on being able to accurately or badly assess risk and need. This chart, and I could put up here probably 25 different studies or examples about the importance of adhering to risk, need, and responsivity. And this chart simply shows that when all three of those principles are adhered to, <coughs> the ability to reduce recidivism is substantial. In this particular study, adhering to all three principles actually produced on average a reduction of 26% in recidivism. There are other studies that show the reduction can be even higher, but the point is, as you move away from adherence to those principles, not only do you find that you degrade your ability to reduce recidivism, but you can actually, by not aligning or adhering to them in any way, again, do more harm than good. And again, all of this, your ability to align with the risk principle, align with the need principle, is really predicated on good, good risk assessment. So, a few things that have come out in recent years that are challenges or critiques of risk assessment, and I think they're valid and they're things that should be on people's radar, <coughs> and future research really actually does need to dig into some of this, but one of these first issues that I wanted to call to your attention, if you're not aware of already, is that the notion of making judgment about individuals, individual offenders, based on statistics or research that is really based on a group of offenders. Um, this is often talked about when we look at risk assessment as being a challenge and one of the difficulties that we have. Despite the fact that risk assessment is important and really drives what we need to do, it's critically, critically important to recognize that there are no perfect risk assessment tools out there. There are always going to be false positives and false negatives and that's the reality of the world in which we work. To think that anything is different, that these tools are going to give you precise estimates of what's going to happen is a fallacy. The third generation of tools that are out there that include or that combine looking at risk factors in terms of static risk but also dynamic criminogenic needs tend to make tools much longer and much more cumbersome, if you will, to implement and to use in real life. The research has shown that tools that are shorter, easier to implement, and are easier for a practitioner to administer tend to have less difficulties and less challenges or less problems in terms of their administration. So inherently, by combining those two, we tend to make risk assessment tools that are looking at risk and need more complicated and that's been a critique or a challenge that's been identified in practitioner and policy circles as well as in the research. There's also discussion recently about the potential for 
the risk factors that have been identified through research to predict recidivism and that are included in these tools to have the potential for discriminatory effects. And what I'm getting at here is that when you look at certain items that tend to be typically used in risk assessment tools, like prior criminal history, age at first arrest, those things can be proxies, not for actual behavior, but for actually the way our system tends to respond to individuals that are out there in the community. And there's an awful lot of controversy about this today and a lot more research that needs to be done. But our understanding about how to eliminate the potential for discriminatory effects in risk assessment tools is something that we need to keep on our radar in the future research really needs to dig into. I also wanted to mention that there has been some some arguments that have been made in recent years and actually two cases that have gone to, to Supreme Courts in states, I believe in Wisconsin and Indiana, that have challenged what I'm going to call here the lack of transparency that exists around some proprietary risk assessment tools. And what I'm getting at is the algorithms that are used in those tools to be able to determine the risk score. Under the concept of discovery in a criminal proceeding, some defendants have argued that they need and have a right to have access to the algorithms that are used in those tools. The companies who have developed those tools under proprietary basis will not release those algorithms in the process of discovery and that's where those two cases went to the Supreme Courts again I believe in Wisconsin and in Indiana this is still a looming issue that's out there and what will happen in this area is very difficult to predict but I want to call it to people's attention because it is an issue that's out there today and I would expect that in the future there will continue to be challenges based on due process grounds and the fact that uh, defendants are entitled and I believe almost there may be a handful of states where that discovery process doesn't take place. I'm not an attorney, but in almost every state across the country, the defendant should have access un under discovery to that kind of information. And what would happen here if there was, let's say, a Supreme Court decision that would force those companies to be able to actually disclose those algorithms, would those companies continue to be involved in the risk assessment business or what this would look like in the future, those are all very open questions. I hope that that makes some sense. But those are some of the key challenges. I also want to mention, and I talk about this when I talk about implementation and the challenges that we know exist in implementation, is that there are huge issues around the administration of risk assessment tools. And what research has found, this is one example where a study was done on probation practitioners and only about a half of those people who were involved in this study who were required to administer validated actuarial tools actually made decisions about case management, what went into the case management based on what those tools actually provided in terms of risk scores and need levels. We also know when we look at, and there are many, many, many studies that point this out, that when we look at case management plans and transition plans, and actually dig into their content that is quite common to find that the content of those plans do not align with the needs that were identified through needs assessment or the risk levels that are identified through those instruments and what scores they produce. So for the sake of time, I'm going to end up with just a couple of comments about the notion of risk assessment for sexual offenders. And I want to mention that there's a very, very distinct difference between the tools that are out there for adult sex offenders and juveniles who have committed sexual offenses. The research on risk assessment tools for adult sex offenders is very robust and it's identified a number of tools that are highly valid and that work extremely well to identify the risk levels both sexual and general for sexual recidivism and general recidivism for adult sexual offenders. That is not the case for juveniles who have committed sexual offenses. For the sake of time, to summarize the science and the research that's been done on tools for juveniles who have committed sexual offenses <coughs> is that there are today no well-validated risk assessment tools that can be used with juvenile sexual offenders. 
That's not to say there aren't a lot of tools that are out there that are being used today, but those tools have not been sufficiently validated to really be able to say with a great degree of trustworthiness and confidence that they are valid in their ability to predict risk for that population. And predicting future sexual misconduct by juveniles is a very, very difficult thing to be able to do. And in fact, our recidivism studies are fraught with problems about it and misconceptions as well. So I want to stop here, but just to make that critically, critically important point, we've got some very well validated and robust tools to use in the adult arena with sexual offenders. That is not the case on the juvenile side. So I'll stop there. And uh, are we just going? Yeah, so we can, um, so our, our intention is to switch now to talk about some of the local things that are being done. Sure. Do you have a question? Is it okay for you to ask? That's sure, no. sure, I think so. Is that all right? Yes. Again, in court and risk of, of future re-arrest. I imagine that the probation risk assessment tool is looking for a different risk, and the sentencing one is a different one, and the corrections one Correct. is a different one. Um, I guess I have a couple of questions. One is, why aren't you more specific about that? Um, and number two, like, what is recidivism to you? Is it new arrest? Is it new conviction? Is it new incarceration? Does that just depend on the user? So your, your point about um, who's asking the question, who's administering the tool, what the origin of that is, is spot on. That um, what, we're, what the definition of risk is, or what we're going to look at in a tool, is going to be contingent on the organization, the agency, the position in the criminal justice system in which that, that particular context has taken place. So, a prime example, like you point out, in the pretrial setting, we may be looking at risk primarily to determine whether someone is likely to commit a new crime while they're out in the community, but also to be able to look at the likelihood that they are going to return to court. Um, very different than what would be done, let's say, if someone is being assessed for risk when they go out onto probation and maybe very different than what would be looked at if someone's going to use this tool in a sentencing context. So you're, you're absolutely right. Um, not, that's just an oversight on my part. In fact, I have it in my notes. I should have done that. But it, you're, you're, it's, it's absolutely a crucial point, and you're spot on, that when we talk about what risk is, it's going to differ. It can very much differ depending on who's asking the question or where that sort of assessment is being emanated from. It, yeah, go ahead. Okay. It's also that there are arguments that are being made now that I will buy into, for example, work that's been done by Doug Marlowe that talks about the fact that risk is really a misconception when we, we use it just sort of in a broad nature as I've done here. That what he talks about is prognostic risk and the notion of being able to look at the likelihood that someone is going to actually um, not it, it, it has very little to do with someone being sort of a violent or a serious offender in terms of predicting outcome, but more has to do with a very nuanced understanding of the likelihood that they're going to engage in some behavior that you don't want that person to be, to be engaged in once they move out into the community, uh, whether that's in probation or coming out of prison or what he has to. Um, I could talk more about Doug Marlowe's work there because Rather than simply looking at the notion of risk and need, what he talks about, and this has primarily been done in the context of substance abusers, but to look at it from a quadrant model and be very specific about matching or, or, or looking at whether someone is high risk, high need, high risk, low need, high need, low risk, and low risk, low need. And they're very specific approaches or, um, if you will, responses that should be put into place, depending on where that individual falls within those quadrants. So one of the things that a risk assessment tool will not tell you is what the level of supervision should be or what the intensity of service should be. It will tell you someone is high risk, low risk, mid risk, or whatever, but those cut points or what those thresholds are will vary depending on a lot of factors. 
Sometimes they're going to vary simply by, if you will, the amount of space that exists within a jail or the number of slots or caseloads that are on probation. And they're actually very artificial breakpoints between what's high, medium, and low risk. Um, and it, you know, it, it would take some time to go into all that. There are a lot of different factors that will determine where those sort of thresholds lie, and they can be quite arbitrary, in fact. They cannot be, they can be based on factors, like I say, like what our system has in terms of capacity, rather than what the true risk levels are of those individuals. Those are some of the challenges and problems that are there with risk assessment. Um, and it doesn't tell us what the level of supervision should be or what the dosage level should be. That needs to be, to be determined through other mechanisms. Um, it simply tells us if you follow the risk and need principle, this person's high risk, this person's low risk, that individual that's high risk should get more supervision than low risk person. Doesn't dictate exactly what those supervision standards should be. And that's an issue that comes up all the time. That's an important issue to talk about. So, so if it's okay, um, can we go through the other presentations and then we'll have questions after? Is that okay? And I, I'm happy to talk yeah, more afterwards. Yeah, thank you. Definitely. Sure. I hope that you guys will. Um, all right. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Ali <coughs> Bhatti. I have a consulting company and I have worked with uh, PSA for the last couple of years. Uh, trying to develop their instrument validated and I'm currently in a revalidation effort. And so they asked me to present a little bit about exactly what I've done and what we've done. And so it's a, it's a quick overview and, and some slides and some findings and, and, uh, and then I'm happy to discuss. So um, quick history about their instrument. They uh, they used to have what uh, 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 what has been described as an or a structured instrument where they had a certain set of factors but the weights were not actually determined. Um, and so in 2000, between 2010 and 12, I partnered with Urban Institute and we developed an actuarial instrument for them. Um, and then it, it was implemented in the year after that. Um, and then about, about 2014, there were some problems that they wanted to look at. We looked at that. And now we are in the process. Oops. Why not some kind of a... Must be um, and so now, this next year, we are in the process of revalidating it uh, and doing some specialized analyses with some of the new issues uh, that were raised about racial bias and things like that. Um, in terms of their instrument, it is a, a multidimensional uh, risk assessment. So it, it looks at or it tries to predict the risk of failure to appear, uh, any kind of non-traffic re-arrest. Uh, they were interested in daring users violent uh, as well as domestic violence. And then they also wanted to look at just domestic violent re-arrest among domestic violent offenders uh, within a subgroup. Um, and then there, there was some interest in looking at uh, surveillance drug tests and how, uh, how, how many of those show up positive. Um, the scoring approach uh, is, is, is standard, uh, and, and I can't go into too much detail. But essentially, the, the idea is that people who fall in groups which have higher recidivism rates get higher scores. Uh, and factors like criminal arrests or uh, other factors get different kinds of weights. Uh, in this case, for example, 0 0.9. Uh, for a different instrument, it might be 0 0.5 or it might be 0 if that variable is irrelevant. I don't know what's going on with this, but <laughs> um, if it's irrelevant for that, for that risk prediction. And then they get aggregated and added up into a grand score uh, for that outcome. So for FDA, would have a score. Um, you know, risk of recidivism or re-arrest would have a score, a violent re-arrest would have a score, etc. And these are the general domains that are included. It's a very static uh, uh, instrument. And the idea is, is static because all they're trying to do is risk uh, prediction so that they can make recommendations of release or not at that point in time. Um, this is different from a, for example, a probation agency which would use that assessment to identify needs and then take care of those needs and programming and things like that. Um, and in general, the instrument does uh, as, you know, fairly well because it's based on and it's been trained on a local population, the data from, from this agency. And so you find that individuals who are classified as high risk, that group does indeed have much higher failure to, re -arrest, uh, failure to appear uh, and re-arrest rates. Uh, some of the distinctions between high and very high are not that clear when you look at things like dangerous violence, uh, simply because the base rates are extremely low. It's only 4 or 5% of the population that actually engages in uh, dangerous or violence re-arrest. Um, 
But eventually, all of this classification then results in recommendations. Um, and so, in general, the trend is towards, or, and, and what you find is that there is either a release on recognizance or personal recognizance, uh, or you have some kind of supervised release conditions, or then PSA would, would say, well, we really cannot recommend any condition or any combination of conditions. Um, and, 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 and the distributions are not exact simply because this involves things like uh, citation releases where offenders are initially released on ROR, but then after, uh, after two weeks or so, they might uh, be under supervision. So it's not a clear-cut one-on-one uh, -on -one kind of a thing, but um, uh, in general, it lines up uh, in their practice. Um, and then, just quickly touching on what the revalidation effort, of course, is to make sure that the weights make sense, it still is predictive, um, and if, if, if new in variables need to be included or new predictors need to be included or some need to be excluded, that work is ongoing. Uh, there is a recommendation matrix that PSA is developing, and, and they will talk about some of that maybe, um, but that is, is part of what the revalidation will try and make sure that the risk is linked with that. And finally, the, the new issue of the issues of racial bias, uh, socioeconomic size bias, um, the, the new literature, uh, a, a, a ton has been revealed. Uh, even though structured and actuarial instruments rely a lot on data and, and are based on data, but the data could have in built biases, and essentially they are honestly reflecting those biases in these instruments. And so we need to make sure that we check for and assess to make sure that those biases are not uh, in, uh, are showing up in these instruments. And that's part of the, the over the next year what we will be establishing. Whether we can purge those predictive biases, whether we find them or not, is tricky because that stuff is still being debated in academic literature and, and there is really no clear-cut answer to how to take care of those issues. Um, and I think I will end here. That's, and I'm happy to answer questions on any of this. And I just want to quickly acknowledge that this is all funded by PSA and as always, if you don't like what you hear and see, don't blame them. <laughs> so I think what, what we're hearing is first the national perspective on the importance of, of understanding where risk and needs puts us, right? And then looking at how it's developed, so the next step is to kind of think about how it's truly being used in D.C. And so Daman is going to speak to us about PSA a little bit more um, and talk to us about his experience with it at PSA a bit with one slide, which I'm guessing is a good one. <laughs> um, I'll just talk to you a little bit about the history of how we develop our risk assessment and things like that. I'm going to talk to you about implementation, actually how we use it at PSA. Um, like, like all risk assessments, uh, risk assessment is basically, you know, is a scorecard in which, you know, based upon the information based on in the defendant's background, they tally up the defendant's score. And then based upon the score, he gets a risk level, if you will. Um, and our risk assessment is just like that. However, it's um, a little bit more complicated and it's automated. So it reduces the error of scoring errors and we can clearly identify who gets this particular risk level. But this is what it looks like and this is what our staff sees. Um, what you see in the first section is the five domains that um, Avi was talking about earlier. And um, in those five domains contain 70 different risk factors. And in that first domain, which says um, demographic and social predictors, that information primarily comes from my interview. Um, recently we developed a um, streamlined interview that went from 11 minutes now down to about four or five minutes. And it primarily focused on the issues of just risk. It only looks for those questions that affects the defendant's risk. The next section is the offense information. With every 30 minutes, the U.S. Attorney's Office and the OAG will send us the um, paper and status, and that's the actual charge the defendant's gonna be presented with. So we want to know the exact charge in which the defendant will be presented with because it can be a huge difference between an arrest charge and actually the charge in which the defendant will be presented from the court. Then the next two sections on criminal justice status, and I'm going to skip over lockup tests and criminal, criminal history, that information primarily comes from the defendant's FBI records and other court databases. It takes about 45 minutes for a staff to investigate and update our system from the defendant's FBI records. So, and then finally, drug tests. Everyone in lockup gets a drug test. And we're testing for, mar not marijuana, we're testing for cocaine, heroin, PCP, and synthetics in lockup. And we get that results back in about two hours. So the drug test results are available to the court um, by the time the defendants are arraigned. 
the top section, which you see, is those four models that we get. We see a failure to appear model, we see a rearrest model, a dangerous and violent rearrest model, and a domestic violence rearrest model. And then the middle section actually contains the total points for each domain. And as you can see, it'd be real difficult for a staff to manually score a defendant because different point, each, each risk model, you can get different points for different risk, the same risk factors. So it's important that the autom automation of this was, is essential to us. And then finally, what you'll see is the total risk score for each model. And, and then what I did down here on this, the slide behind at the bottom is if staff wants to question how the defendant scored, you can expand those domains. See, well, staff can expand these domains and actually see the risk factors and the score factors. <coughs> so in the event that there's any type of questions whatsoever for the risk model. But um, so that's what it looks like. But the question is, is how do we implement it? And I think it's important that there's two words. We training and education. We had to train our staff and educate the staff on this new risk assessment. Um, because what happens, pre-trial pre always use some type of risk assessment for the longest time. And our previous risk assessment is not that much different than this one. It's, it's, it's really not that much different. So transitioning from the old risk assessment to this new risk assessment um, was not that difficult. But it did present some type of obstacles for us. Um, in the past, staff saw um, high charges typically meant high risk. And low charges typically meant low risk. Um, staff had to get uh, accustomed to seeing that someone with charged with simple assault can have the same similar risk score as someone with robbery. And that presented some challenge to us, but we had to con constantly engage our staff and talk to them about uh, this is not, no one risk factor determines the defendant's overall risk. We really, really had to work with our staff to get that done because they saw high charge, high risk, that's there. But we really work with our staff. The other thing that they had to do, they used to only see two risk, back, um, risk models, failure to appear and rear rest. Now they see four. And then they had to figure out, what is this thing called risk-based recommendations? So we had to really engage with them to talk to them about how to make recommendations based upon the defendant's risk. So, we had, so dealing with the staff was more engaging and constantly working with them and answering questions. Um, but we could not implement our risk assessment without the buy-in from the court. So the buy-in from the court was critical. We focused on we focused on the judges who primarily presided over the arraignment of defendants at initial appearance. We just focused on that group. And we didn't focus on the science behind our risk assessment or the, on the four different models. What we focused on is what the different recommendations meant. And for example, if the judge saw us recommending something like um, address verification or reporting condition, that typically meant that a defendant had a low to moderate risk of being rearrested or failed to appear. Then conversely, if they saw us recommend a high intensity supervision program, that typically meant the defendant had a higher risk of failing to appear or being rearrested. So that's how we kind of educated our judges. That was a very small group of judges, like four of them typically. So we were really able to get their buy-in and understanding that any type of time they had questions in regards to recommendation, we were available to, their, to answer any questions for them. So now that the staff has the risk assessment, we've got the buy-in, we're ready, then how did they make the recommendation? Everybody who's arrested in District Columbia and charged with offense gets a risk assessment. Everybody gets a risk assessment. And then we make our recommendation, what we call what is the least restrictive conditions of release. And, um, we, and what that does, what that means is we don't want to add conditions of release that may harm the defendant from failing to appear or being rearrested. So we're very careful of what type of conditions we impose on the defendant. So that's what we do every day for everybody who comes in. We actually look at each individual, their risk level, and then make the appropriate recommendations based on the defendant's risk. Once the judge makes that recommendation and the defendant's um, conditions release are ordered, we know the defendant has to be supervised. And right now, the agency is in the process of developing supervision strategies to supervise people based upon their risk level. 
So <clears throat> that's in the process now. We hope that that's gonna come out soon, and Mike Williams probably will probably guarantee that's gonna come out soon. So, um, but that's what we do every day. Any questions for me? I have a question. Uh -huh. You mentioned something about synthetic drugs. I uh -huh. thought one of the benefits of using synthetic drugs was that it couldn't be detected by known drug tests. Mm -hmm. Have y'all created something? Yes. Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yes. We can test and find the synthetic drugs. I mean, it changes all the time. So you're constantly trying to keep up with the new change because one change to it means a different drug. Mm -hmm. so. I think legal. Thank for that great work, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Former PSA director spearheaded those efforts in the district. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of different chemical compounds, and they yes. change it every time it gets added to the mm -hmm. schedules mm -hmm. for what can be prosecuted. So every time something new comes That's out, they got to add to the schedule. They got to add it to the test. But you know, they can be detected. It's a matter of what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> David, please add to that if you'd like. No, I have questions for the, the DSA representative. Do we have time? Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I want to make sure we get the DOIRS folks time when we're after 11 already. So I appreciate everyone kind of <laughs> holding on. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and so we've heard about the local stuff. We've heard about the adult stuff. But it's also important that we think that, you know, there are different principles at play when we talk about juveniles. So the DOIRS. Hi everyone, I'm Amanda Pedrudi. I'm from, I work at DYRS, I'm a policy and research officer there. Um, I drag poor Megan McNeil along with me here today. She ends up doing the on the ground, which they, uh, we use a structured decision making tool at DYRS. There's a tool itself and there's a matrix, a dispositional matrix. I am, uh, and like I said, I, I brought Megan here today because she actually does half of it. It's the way we sort of do a check and balance internally. I am actually not gonna talk a lot about the SDM today because what I do want to talk to you about is how we do it, how we communicate about it, why we do it, why the why it exists the way it exists, um, as a complement to everything that these guys have discussed. Because of course, um, the SDM is is it's a structured decision making tool. There's data in it, but one of the things I, I want to sort of press on is the fact that at the end of the day, these assessments and screens, SDM is a screen, are political in nature, and context matters. Uh, and that pertains to all of us. Uh, so with that, oh, and also, of course, in the context of a juvenile justice agency, some of the pressures we face are a little different. Okay, so here's my, my general agenda here. Um, I'm gonna tell you why, you know, what the, what the point is here. The big picture, the what for of the assessment, to what end, case planning. So what happens when you have the SDM, what do you do with it? What do you do with it when you have a risk assessment or screening? Um, and how does we go back and continually uh, talk about it within the agency? Okay, so first things first, keeping in mind the research, for a juvenile justice agency, uh, punitive sanctions don't have a significant uh, effect on preventing new offenses. So locking a kid up is probably not gonna get you a significant public safety outcome. The severity of offense isn't significantly related to future of, offense, future of offending, and the folks at PSA were just talking about this. A robbery doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna commit another offense in the future. Uh, and likewise, the, a shoplifting charge Maybe not either. The confinement has diminishing returns after about six months. This is from the Pathways to Desistance study. If you're if you're interested, path, that Pathways stuff is awesome. Uh, so, in other words, locking a kid up for a long time isn't going to get you much. The and most low-risk youth are unlikely to commit a new offense, even if you do nothing. That's been said before in this room. Uh, but mixing them with higher-risk youth can make them worse. Uh, and I want to mention too, in the context of this, sort of nationally, right? I think risk assessments have had a big influence in the fact that we've gone from about 100,000 young people locked up in 2002 to about 50,000 today. And I, I mean, we are, this is a process, I think. And at the same time, uh, racial ethnic disparities, have we haven't made much of a dent. And I think in some places they've gotten worse. Um, but risk assessments have played a role here. So keep that in mind, too. What are risk and needs assessments for? And this is in part, I've given a similar, a similar presentation to public information officers um, because often they're the ones that end up with the media calls, right, or they're dealing with judges. And so some of this is messaging, is at the end of the day, the words you use and the way you're talking about something matters. Uh, so we're taking an eye on the long view here. You're risking out in long-term public safety and positive outcomes, it matters, right? So the desire to be punitive and, and have a response right now 
um, is strong, I get it, but we're, we want to have a safer community in the long run, so bear that in mind. We're targeting resources. We've heard that before, too, in this room. You don't want to just throw stuff at the lowest risk youth. If they're not going to get much, you're not going to get much, and it's a waste of money at the end of the day. There's uh, studies from across the country that have taken that up. Texas, for example, uh, talks about that a lot. Uh, research, we all love to do research. Once you have an SDM or some kind of risk assessment score, then you're comparing like youth to like youth. So then you can talk about impacts of programming, whatever intervention you've got, how you're spending money, all of that stuff. Citing your work, it's more than a feeling. <coughs> you've got this, you know, I hate to say it, but when you're going to court or you're making an argument to somebody else, you've got this thing, this thing that's got research behind it, it's got evidence behind it, that you can say, listen, I did this thing. It has a score, it gave me a result. It helps you with your argument. I know, I'm very excited about that. Uh, in a juvenile justice agency, this happens to us sometimes, and I think it, it probably comes up in other places too. There's a balance to be struck between being punitive and being paternalistic. And what I mean by that is we sometimes go in these circular uh, conversations about public safety and best interest of the child, right? So you've got maybe a young person who's not likely to commit another offense, that's what our risk assessment says, but for some reason, for something else is going on with them, um, that, that we're feeling like a, a psychiatric residential facility is, is the way to address their needs. But I, I think there's always, we always have to be a, have a check on ourselves here, um, because I, I mean, as I, t I tell, I say this potentially again, a controversial thing to say, is what would we do with a white kid with the same diagnosis that hasn't committed an offense or maybe did commit an offense but didn't get caught, right? Which is even more likely. This is where we get to the case planning part of this. Um, and I sort of, as much as, we sort of be careful here, because again, context matters. These things, our SDM doesn't just spit out the answer, right? Um, and for us, there's, you, we need a little interpretation, right? My little guy here, is it a car, is it a road? Is it a guy with binoculars, what is this? Um, and again, this has come up too. Risk isn't the same as need. Need isn't the same as service. Your results of that SDM are not going to equal an outcome. So, so what I mean by that is if you have a high score, it does not mean that a young person tomorrow is going to commit another offense the next day. You're not, it's not a one for one, this is not minority report. Um, and always bear in mind that there are limitations. This, none of this is perfect. And again, I'm, I'm being slightly repetitive here. Um, for us, there's a context, I, I mentioned this uh, sort of vaguely, but specifically for DYRS, we take into account positive youth development, right? And these, these things, one of the pushbacks we sometimes get is there's no strengths in this thing. Well, RSDM, and this happens in other places too, you, you name the assessment, I could give you all kinds of acronyms. Um, it's meant to get at public safety, so no, there's no accounting for the fact that this young person was a quarterback on the football team. No, it doesn't account for the fact that they have a great relationship with their grandmother. All of those things um, are just, they're just not in there because that's not what it's for. Um, but when we talk about it, when we talk about placement decisions, and again, this is very much political, um, we do think about what it is that we're actually going to recommend. I love the way PSA was talking about that, too. Uh, case planning, again, you are not, you know, just because you have a higher score doesn't mean that you are, uh, we're going to throw the, the most intensive services at you. We do have a graduated responses approach. Um, and we have other decision making tools too. The, the CAFIS is a, function, a functional assessment that the city uses. Um, and we think that's important. It didn't, my, that acronym didn't make it up there. But the MAZI, the CASAS, that's Education and Workforce Development, and the GAIN I um, and the GAIN Short Screener too are all assessments that DYRS bring to bear. Okay. And what and not done. This is my favorite because this is where we get involved. Uh, one of the things that I say this all the time, and hopefully we're doing a somewhat good job, is to keep talking about it in the agency over and over again. Um, really believe that people want to do a good job, so we show them the data. Here you guys, here's the data. This is how we're using it. Uh, this is how you're using it in particular. Um, and sort of be clear that, that we're part of a big picture in the nation, the, the nation of reform here. It's like we're not doing this alone. Um, and we're, we do try to do regular check-ins. So I've been back at the agency now for two years. We've had two to three trainings. We're going to do another one next week. Um, and again, things change. Um, and we've gotten our own sort of um, aha moments around 
how the way the city thinks about public safety, how the city wants to work with the most vulnerable young people that come to our agency. Um, so we have some work to do to adjust the SDM, our risk assessment, um, on our end. Um, did I miss anything? I can, this is like, I'll tell you that I am a sort of loyal opposition when it comes to risk assessments, right? I say use them, just be careful, be way aware of the words you're using, the ones that the are in our stuff, I think, I can also have a background in some of, some of the adult stuff. But just bear in mind that we are, the like, criminogenic needs, okay, but these are kids, right? So you're talking about their unique needs, you're talking about the gaps between what a young person can do and adult expectations. The concepts are not really different, but how you're talking about it is very different, and that'll inform how we're working with young people. And I would argue someday that we'll win and the adults will start doing this too, the, to the criminal justice side. Um, sorry, so that's all I gotta say. If you wanna reach out to us, please do. We are happy to talk about the, the SDM more specifically if you if you have any interest um, or, or anything that I have said here. Um, and that's all I got. And, and you can leave it on the screen. What I'm going to do is for everyone that has signed in, you have an email address on there, as long as I can read what you wrote. <laughs> I'm going to send out all of these slides that were used today to everyone that's in attendance, so you'll have these as well. Um, but so can we work backwards from, from this one, since it's the freshest, and say first, do we have questions for our presenters from DYRS? Comments, concerns, criticisms? No. Thank you. <laughs> I think one thing that I, I heard was that from everyone is that it's about making sure the people doing it are educated about what it's putting out yep. right and so that's juvenile that's adult that's national and local right and so when you guys do these trainings who are you training our case managers and those are the folks that are actually using the tool yep. right excellent and what is the feedback from that oh boy it's amazing um, it depends on the day. It depends on the day, right? And so <laughs> what we else do, they've heard that day? <laughs> what else they've heard that day? And we do them infrequently enough that we don't. We only do it in commitment or recommitment. Mm -hmm. So last month, for example, we had six new commitments, mm -hmm. and we have 20 case managers. And it's usually our risk assessment, our assessment folks that are doing it right. So people forget, um, and it's very easy to sort of revert, revert back to oh, robbery, awesome. new beginnings. Um, so I think, and we had this other, um, for the first time, we were able to take the SDM and compare it to recidivism. Um, and so that was, I think, you know, folks were like, gosh, uh, so for the, the young people that had a high SDM score, whether we put them in the community or we lock them up, the outcomes in terms of public safety were about the same. So that was a little, it's our own data, it's consistent with national research, but. whereas. If you take the low kids and you look at the ones that went in the community versus the ones that went to an RTC, you saw that there was a significant difference and the ones that got sent away were more likely to recidivate, uh, which is consistent with the past pathways research and all of that. So I would say at the end of the day, in terms of affecting decision making, I think it was pretty soon after that, we had a decrease in the number of uh, placements at home. I know that we had at least, oh yes. Um, I just have a question about, um, <laughs> about um, when DYRS goes away from what's recommended from the SDM. And I know they, DYRS can choose to you know, go higher or lower than what the, the score turns to. What actually is looked at when making that decision to move away from what the tool says? That is. Uh, great question. We were, Ellen, we were talking about this with Ellen yesterday. So it's this is this is where the, the structured judgment part of this comes in. Uh, the other assessments will matter. So we also have we'll have a psychological and a psychoeducational. Um, but then there is also some conversation about family involvement that often comes out a lot. Um, there is a little bit of clinical judgment in there, but at the end of the day, it ends up. Um, and ends up we're trying to bring all of this to bear as well as the SDM. Now I'll tell you that part of what your the, the exceptions, the, the override underrides, they had gotten to the point where you know we were like, oh wait a minute, wait a minute, there's something, and, and most of them were underrides, um, if that's a word, right? So most of the time the SDM would say X and we went under it. 
So, but that says something about both the way the tool is designed, but then the way we're making decisions. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. I, I realize what I just said is sort of like, you have it and you kind of use it. <laughs> uh, but yeah. But it's also though that most of the time there is a decision outside of the tool that is open. Yes. Yeah. David, I know you used to ask some specific questions for PSA. Just for PSA, yeah. So when you guys mentioned that you do not use the arrest charge, you use the uh, you use the prosecutorial <coughs> charge as opposed to the arrest. And then you also mentioned criminal history and the FBI and Triple I. Now Triple I, from my understanding, is composed of both sentences and arrests, but not prosecutorial charges. So how are you are you using arrests in the Triple I in the criminal history? Um or are you using we put your first question, we prefer to use the prosecutor, prosecutor, prosecutor's charges when we do doing our report. Sometimes that's not always possible. Um, a lot of times prosecutors won't actually give us the charge until late in the day, sometimes 5.30, 6 o'clock. We're probably done with processing most of our cases around 4.30. But, um, but the primary goal is to get the prosecutor talk, prosecutor, prosecutor's charge here. Um, when it comes to the FBI record, FBI records will have both. Um, FBI records will show the rest charge, but when it shows the disposition, which will show the actual charge which he was convicted of. So it, ch it changes both. So you won't use an arrest without a conviction or without, without a disposition? No, no if, if it's a di arrest without a disposition, that goes into our, a different section of our criminal history. It counts as an arrest, but it doesn't count as a conviction. So um, the risk assessment counts are convictions and arrests separately. The, the process f begins at arrest. As soon as we know the defendant is arrested, we start our background investigation on the defendant. Um, and the information comes, as we start inputting different information to the system, it starts calculating the risk score. So one arrest, it starts adding that into it. Then two arrests start adding. So it, whatever we enter into the system, it actually affects the risk assessment. Once we interview the defendant and put that information in the system, it adds it to the risk assessment. So the, the whole process starts at arrest and ends when we actually produce the actual report for the court. I apologize if those numbers are difficult to see all the factors from all the way back here. Is there any assessment of the risk of the I'll be saying we don't believe he has that we have that type of detail. I think all we can identify is whether it's a domestic violence charge or not. Yes. We don't have the, the, the lethality and other aspects of the charge. I mean, would you think, do you think that that's maybe a gap? I mean, one of the things we know when we look at risk factors and threat assessments around domestic violence and stalking specifically is that involvement with the criminal justice system increases the risk of lethality to those victims. And so looking at what other factors are present before making a determination Yeah, if we had that information, that would be absolutely valuable, but I don't believe we, so the data doesn't capture that, that level of detail. Is there a way to fill in the data capturing that? Like, uh, looking at the, the details of the arrest report, or even having that risk assessment with the victim? Well, let me just say, I'm Mike Williams, I'm the Deputy Associate Director at PSA. PSA is a neutral party in the criminal justice system, so in none of our work do we take into account the factors of the charge, specific charges. So the, the details that you were talking about, and we've been talking with DC Safe about being involved in the lethality project. Um, we've kind of been on the fence with that because traditionally we have not taken a, a side. We don't take a side. We're a neutral party in the system. Now, is it a flaw? I don't know. That's a debatable topic. But our current practice is that's not part of any of our assessments. Charges. Again, we, we take into account the 
fact that this is a domestic violence offense, but the actual circumstances of the of the offense is what we don't take into account. One, we don't have it. We don't we don't even get it. We we sometimes get the Gerstein's from the U.S. Attorney's Office or the Attorney General's Office, but that's not part of our regular practice. As a quick follow up to that, so if this is the third domestic violence case that you have had, not the specific victim, but the fact that it's the third arrest for a domestic violence offense is calculated into the risk assessment. Um, this is for PSA or DYRS. Um, about what fraction of your information is self-reported by the offenders, and are you worried about uh, lying, I guess, to get better outcomes? Um, for DYRS, a lot of it is uh, comes from the other assessments that are done, um, the COPAS, um, the psychoeducational uh, reports, stuff like that. So it's, yes, it has some self-reporting, but it's from another tool or um, being interpreted by somebody else. Um, the, the part that I do is just the offense history, which I uh, get straight from Justice, which is fed by Corpio. Um, so it's mostly DC specific arrests. If we know of stuff outside of the city, we'll take that into account as well. But the social factors are kind of, but not totally. <laughs> um, for pretrial, the interview is a self report. Yes. Um, but the criminal history is typically coming from the defendant's FBI records or other court databases or criminal justice agency. Um, so I would say probably only about 20% is self-reported. We always verify it through some other means. And also to add, the, the relevance of the criminal history is the biggest predictor. So that even though 20% is coming in terms of what it contributes to the actual assessment, it's probably down to 5 or 7%. I worked for the uh, United States Sentencing Commission, and we, it, it wasn't so much risk, I, I guess it was, but the probation officers would actually, for pre-sentencing, would interview the defendants at length. And yes, part of the recommendation to the federal judges on sentence length came from their interview, a lot of it came from their criminal history and they were weighted based on severity, age, stuff like that. I guess my question is, how how is it possible that you have a four minute interview with offenders, defendants, and you're able to get all of the information you possibly could to take up 20% of a risk score? Well, the interview that we're conducting only focus on what's needed to for the risk assessment. Not all questions are needed for the risk assessment. So what we did is eliminated those questions. Like it didn't matter if you was the name of the school that you attend. It's the fact of whether you were in school or not in school. Um, if you was employed, we want to know was you employed, the name of the employer and how much you made was irrelevant to us. So we eliminated all those questions to say whether you're employed or unemployed and the employer's name. Can I make a clarifying point? I think you're talking about two different points in the system. I think, so. I think yes. you're talking about yeah, sentencing right. and you're talking about making mm -hmm. potential determinations for folks that aren't in that. I want to make sure that folks are aware that there are right. different kinds of things. Because we talk about why we do risk assessment and at different points in the system, you can do them at detention. You can do them at you know placement decision making, right. like a structured decision making tool. So there's different places. Judges can also use them at the sentencing point, and that's where actually there's a lot of conversation and thinking about the Constitution out here, right? So, sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. no. We used to be, and, and I'm sorry, I'm going to interject too that the District of Columbia, what one other place, doesn't have bail. So, which I, I sort of want to mention that that is a huge innovation that the District of Columbia has been leading. Like, props to PSA, because no one else is doing it. Well, so just to, in, in court services in, in the district that does the probation, they have a huge long interview and, and they have all this stuff exactly for that purpose because they use it to then do their services and plan around that. It's an important interview, which is a different piece. I think you would have your hand up or something. My question is uh, piggyback off of this question here um, from corrections. Uh, I know the 
process from CCB for arrest um, to the cell block and then intake to our facility. Now we processed, we intake um, over 11,000 people last year and a lot of them are repeat offenders. So my question is, with this risk and needs assessment that happens at PSA, um, what, I guess the window of when that happens and what you spoke about, a lot of that information has been honed down to be very specific. But because a lot of those are repeat offenders for the same crimes, um, I, I guess I, I'm wondering about what is used how is that information used to inform a judge's decision on sentencing or what? Well, I think our information is not used for sentencing. That's, that's number one. But I think it's also important to note that our, I think our fail to appear rate and our rearrest rate is quite low. We're talking like 12%. So, um, so we're, we're really doing well of assessing the defendant's risk and um, put, putting the proper supervision techniques in place to ensure that he will show up for court and not get rearrested. So I'm not sure, since we, our information is not used for sentencing, of how that plays you know, a role in. For me, in education for me, when I was learning about PSA's risk assessment when I was hired two years ago, I wanted to use all the information they were collecting on the study I was working on. And I kept saying, well, can't you give me this? Well, can't you give me that? And they said, you have to remember what it is we're predicting risk of. Yes. And so for them, it's risk of reoffending or not appearing from this date right. to the time at which the sentencing occurs, right? So what they're predicting is something very different. And for me, I really had to sit and think that through and make sure, because getting you know, um, an education level as a self-report, okay, <laughs> for that purpose, it's super useful. But for the purposes of things like sentencing, and so for me, it took a little while to really sink that in in my head, but I had to get there. Um, and so it's about, and, and so when you're at DYRS, you're using it to predict something completely different. You know, if you want to predict long-term recidivism, that's the point that Roger is speaking to. Mm -hmm. If we want to think about long-term recidivism, that's a different item entirely. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, right there. Sorry. Uh, this is more of a comment than a question. I guess on the theme of, yeah, the what is at risk will tend to vary from place to place, and you got to be very conscious of that. Um, I just want to comment that I've never seen a risk assessment that risk assessments seem to always be focused on uh, the person as a perpetrator what is their risk of perpetrating some negative event mm -hmm. um, we never talk about risk of victimization yes. and that has been uh, I'm working with the federal system where we're working a risk assessment to figure out security levels and it's always about what's their risk of committing misconduct in prison one of the most common times I've seen staff override our system is because of victimization mm -hmm. risks. They'll take um, young people, mm -hmm. particularly, who were set to go to high security prisons and bump them down the medium because they're worried that they'll be victims of sexual assault yes. there. Yes. And that's a case where, yeah, I have to agree with them. They are addressing a limitation of risk assessments. We are worried about what's their individual chances of causing trouble, not does their presence make the people around them more of a risk? Um, I guess the same could happen if you happen to have a punchable face or something like that. You know, like risk what's, 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 the, what's your effect of the risk of, uh, of the risk scores of the people around you? That happens with DYRS all the time. That's yes. why, thankfully, we have the override, underride. Mm -hmm. And in, in the facilities, of course, we have PREA assessment. Yes. Um, that's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Before we I have one more question. Hang on about that. Okay, hang on. So I know some folks are speaking out. We are starting to run out of time. I am here. Anybody who's able to say, please do. We'll continue this conversation as long as you like. Um, and if you are speaking out, please leave your evaluation by the door. And yes, your question. Right. So I have a question for Amanda about the underwrite, um, Amanda. So when you saw the decrease in sending kids away because it wasn't as effective, was that, do you think, of a result of like the mayor and the city council coming up with more robust programs to help the kids stay in DC, get the help they need. Like for example, if a new group home opened up in DC around the time somebody was making these decisions and decided, oh, instead of sending them to RTC, 
in Kentucky that's less effective, we're going to keep them here in this new group home that just opened up in D.C. last month, you know, fill them, fill, you know, or how the mayor and the city council come up with ways to get rid of the box. If you're an ex-offender, you can still apply for jobs and not admit you're a criminal to help people that your own research shows employment helps, you know. Sure. No, I think that's part of it, but at the end of the day, if we don't make the decision, can't access any of that stuff. And I, it's sort of, I know it's sort of cyclical, uh, but DYRS, is, uh, DYRS does a lot of its own programming too, but I mean, you're right, that's part of it. You have to have some place for them to go, um, but there was this affirmative, we have to make the decision to keep them at home. Make the decision, guys. And by the way, I didn't mention that our arrests continue to be at some of the lowest levels they've been ever. So, yeah. I do my own evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. More questions? Hey, Alan. Great. Okay. Oh, Roger, yes. Damon uh, and Mike, I want to, if you guys, I, I'm curious about what you're doing um, to develop some information like supervision levels based on your assessment. You, you mentioned that that stuff is in progress right now. Yeah, that's, that's our new effort. Yeah. We're not sure what we're doing. Except, okay. Except we're trying to tie the supervision level to the risk factor. Yeah, so yeah, I'm just curious. Then if it's just a lower level risk, we don't want increased supervision requirements. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yes, <laughs> <laughs>